Anything out of bounds for you? Anything at all where you go, geez, I'm not comfortable Yes. With that. Um, things that I think will hurt somebody in the moment. Mm-hmm. There's a difference to me between a subject like uh, wheelchairs or burn victims. I know what my motives are at all times. But to sit, so for a burn victim to be here, I don't mean you don't do racial jokes if there's a black guy or woman right. jokes if there's women. I'm saying if you're going out of your way to be vicious to somebody, to hurt somebody, and your excuse is I'm trying to be funny – you're being phony. To me, that's off limits. I really try, as vicious as I can be, to never truly try to hurt somebody because I really want people to laugh. Man. Right. And, uh, you know, you don't want somebody to fucking – to be hurt by what you're doing. So for your thing is uh, you would want the people – let's say if you were doing an Italian joke, you'd want the Italians to laugh at it. Absolutely. You don't want the Italians to be the only people in the room not laughing. Not at all because there's nothing you could talk about that will make me want to walk out. Mm-hmm. I, there's an, I, I'm one of these ignorant people. I hold everyone else to the same standards I hold myself to. You know what I mean? I don't, I, I don't care how radical you are on stage. I may find it repulsive, but I would never go, uh, or, <laughs> hey, Bob, <laughs> ever. Mm-hmm. I loved, loved, I love Farrakhan. I, for, I really do. I loved Khalid Muhammad because these guys just enraged people. Um, I didn't like what they said. I thought a lot of it was just shit. Um, but I like the fact that to me they're great Americans because what they're doing is saying things that make people want to put bullets in them and they're free to say it. That to me, honestly, it's like – it's, it's funny. It's like one of the sig pics on, 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 on .net, message board that hates my guts, has a great fucking thing. It's, it's free speech is not defending popular speech because by, by definition, popular speech doesn't need to be defended. I don't know whose original quote that is, mm-hmm. but it's brilliant, and we've lost that. And it really is frightening that, that people are now – they want this word banned. And not, it's like, what are you fucking doing, man? We're phony. We go around the world trying to impose our will on everybody else and talk about democracy, and we're simply just trying to pick apart pick apart what you can say and what you can't say and what's appropriate what's not appropriate just because somebody might be offended. Not because they're going to be hurt like fire in a movie theater, but they might be offended. You know, I had never really thought about that until you brought it up, but if you look at uh, Malcolm X and uh, – and then even on the other side and, and go to like George Wallace, we don't have anybody who's that good on stage from a political point of right. view. There used to be great speakers. John F. Kennedy was a, a great speaker. Sure. Bobby Kennedy was a great speaker. But nobody would say George Bush or Gore or any of those guys really grab a room. It's, no. it's almost a lost art form. Well, Reagan, I think – I mean I think they called him the great communicator because he had an ability. I believe he had a Democratic Congress or Senate or whatever it was, and he had an ability to get shit through because he was such a wonderful speaker. Clinton was good too. Clinton's mm-hmm. a charismatic guy, man. You can't not love but Clinton. Ma- maybe that, but you never remember their speeches. Those speeches are rarely quoted as much as some of the other people from yeah. the 60s. I, I don't know. Part of that's probably because we're not putting out good people. Part of it's also because with, with, with the internet and with 50 channels and with cable, there's so many more out. Let's, it's almost like when you said something in 1960, there were three stations and the radio station broke into it. Right. There wasn't all distractions of scandal. You, you imagine fucking Marilyn Monroe, the two brothers, how fast that would have made the papers today. But back then they laid off. They didn't photograph FDR in a wheelchair. It's like everything you said, everybody watched. Right. You know what I mean? And then media didn't attack you a certain way. So it, it, I just think it was a different – way of communicating back then as well. It's also interesting to me that you're a guy who says, I don't speak much outside myself, and I see you doing that quite a bit when you want to. You know, yeah, goes, yeah, yeah. It goes uh, apart from some of the things that you say about yourself. Well, like I, when I say I don't, I, mean, I don't always obsessively talk about my own life, but if I talk about politics I, or whatever, I just try to skewer it honestly. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe what I say is my own honest feelings about things are all, I'm not always right. I know that. I'm an ass sometimes. I'm a self-important idiot. I fucking trash things on the radio, and I'm wrong. And I'm, mm-hmm. well, my opinion is wrong. But it's honest. You know what I mean? Who the fuck said you always have to be right? As long as you're telling the truth as you see it. You know, I mean, it, it, that's, that's, that's all I have, I should say. All right, let's uh, – some folks going over here, and we'll take some questions uh, for Jimmy and uh, get this thing going. Just walk on over here to the uh, microphone. Now you've been listening. Everyone's a little fucking nervous now, aren't you? <laughs> oh, no, gee, I've, these are all the people in the dark making those moaning I've noises. Just, I've just put them to sleep. <laughs> and they're all like, all right, look, melatonin. <laughs> <laughs> it always takes one. Here you go. What's your name, man? Hey, Joe. Hi, hey, Joe. Joe. Hey, uh, Jimmy, uh, one of your first big breaks was uh, with Dice. Yes. And uh, I noticed uh, listening to the show and a lot of the replays, uh, especially when uh, the guys would would uh, tear into him a little bit uh, after after the the, the meltdown uh, he had. 
uh, you're you're always very quiet about yes. that. Um, is there any animosity with the way things shook down? Um, uh, knowing, uh, you know, he he gave you you know such a big big stage to, to work with, yet he he went shitty on you. He, well, what happened with Dice was Andrew. Uh, I had a weird thing with him. My loyalty is with Opie and Anthony because um, uh, I've been with them for so long, and they, what they've done for me is, you know, I never fail to recognize what the guys have done. And it's not out of politeness. It's for real. I mean, they come to my book signing. They don't make money from that. They get nothing from that other than supporting me, and they like to meet the fan. You know what I mean? So my loyalty is with those guys. Andrew never bashed me personally. Um, I know what he was doing with the radio show is just trying to make himself, I, I think, just trying to get something started to go on Stern. I, it makes me sad more than angry what happened because I loved him. I mean, I really – he changed my life. Um, it would be hard for me to bash Dice unless – if he attacked me, I would attack him back. Have but you talked had, to him since that happened? Yes. I've seen him once. Yeah. I saw him in L.A. We had, what, what made me angry about Andrew, though, was I was touring with him and uh, Jim Florentine, and then he uh, stopped calling me back. We were supposed to do a date in Seattle. I just never heard from him again, and I didn't know why. So that kind of pissed me off. And then two years later, I saw him in Los Angeles, and we said hello. We hugged, and um, I'm like, what happened? He's like, ah, I was going through my divorce. I was not good at talking, and uh, it was over a joke. He thought I took a Christopher Reeve joke from him, and I'm like, man, I'm a comic. All I have is my integrity. What was the joke? And he goes, ah, it's not a long time ago. Maybe I'm wrong, man. I apologize. It was, you know, I was you know, in a weird place. I'm like, tell me the joke, and I forget what the joke was. But our jokes on Christopher Reeve were completely different. So it was like maybe it was something else. You know what I mean? But I didn't steal a joke. But I, I have a really weird feelings about Dice. It makes me sad that, that it happened like that. You know, that, do, I really do you did think love some comics always need that, that feud, though, to drag them? You know, I remember Dice used to fight with Kinnison, mm -hmm. and they both fought with different people. And it just seems like sometimes comics need that almost like rappers. they got to have somebody to be pissed at. Yeah, I, I just think that he didn't need it with Opie and Anthony because mm -hmm. those guys really loved him. I mean, they really did. Opie Op would hang out of this house. I mean, they were friends, off the air friends. We they were just off the came radio. from left field. There's no reason that completely anybody... shocked. I mean, and the, this is stuff you'll hear on the air, but it's something I remember happening in person. And, and what, like, the, what the fuck is he doing? Why? It was confusion more than anything. And uh, he said he was angry because Opie never called him back uh, when he called. Before, Dice said, "I want to talk to Opie before I go on the show because Opie's dad had been killed." And he, and, and he said, "I can't just go on and do the radio." But Opie wasn't calling anybody back th then. He wasn't thinking of being courteous and calling a guy back. He was just trying to get through every day. So, um, you know, that to me, it just made me sad that Dice took that route. And it seems like friendships are really almost everything to you. It seems like some of your comic friends are the longest relationships of your life. Yeah, I mean, well, again, I'm doing comedy 18 years now almost. So it's like those are the guys I've been seeing for years. Mm -hmm. But there's that weird bond, man. You, you, you just – I, my, my friends and I don't see each other often. I'll literally – it's funny. I'll be in the cellar one night. The next night, I'm in Dallas. He's in Los Angeles. He's in, in fucking Florida. Right. And I don't see them for a month. I'm like, oh, yeah, you moved to L.A. Fuck, I forgot. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're my longest relationships. I mean – and I'll always probably know Dice unless something ugly happens. Um, but I don't see it as, as happening. To me, I, I'm hoping everybody makes up someday. I, I'm like a little codependent whore. Beyond your uh, comedy friends, uh, do you ever uh, talk to uh – uh People that you grew up with and, and have them go, Jesus, I hadn't seen you for years. And, you know, they're on HBO tonight. Is that uh, the kid, uh, he and I used to blow each other <laughs> under his porch. <laughs> you know, that's got to be weird because I have the feeling you don't look all that different from when you're like six or seven. Probably not. <laughs> nor, do I, nor do I behave that differently. <laughs> Give me those ribs. Um, <laughs> um, fuck it. That was a sitcom little comeback. <laughs> Fucking head should pop out of a laughing box sometimes when I talk. <laughs> um, yeah, man, there's certain people I got sober with that I still see and still talk to. But again, comedy has become so all-encompassing for me that I've lost touch with most people because seven nights a week I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And my whole life is that. And I don't, I don't mean that to be you know, pseudo-deep. You know, it's my life. But it really is. It, 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 I, I'm obsessed. And I have been since I started. And it didn't wane. It got more and more and more. So the relationships that I've maintained are comedian relationships, even from way back when. Bobby mm -hmm. Levy, uh, one of my closest friends. Florentine. Florentine got me my first paid gig in comedy when he was jamming Jim. And he had <laughs> long blonde hair. And I'm like, who is this horse's ass? <laughs> he was just like a dumb D. Snyder looking guy. And he got me my first paid gig in, in, in 1990. And he's been one of my closest friends. So those are relationships I've kept. You know, you got sober so uh, early. And now you yes. say you struggle with the sexual addictions. Any of the other addictions ever come back to haunt you? Ever, you know, still 
depressed about alcohol and drugs or? Well, it's 